Let me tell you a story, a tale I once heard. Welcome, you are listening to Ladies Who Genre, a book club podcast for ladies and not ladies who like to genre now and then. I'm your host, Morgan. And I'm your other host, Noelle. So quick spoiler warning, this is not going to be a spoiler-free podcast, so if you've not read this episode's book and are a little bit sensitive to spoilers, please do pause the podcast now and go ahead and come back later after you've read it. Also, just a little bit of a trigger warning, this book does contain scenes of mild torture, and we will probably discuss those. So should you have any kind of need to avoid that? Also, maybe don't want to be here. This week specifically, we are discussing the book Witches of New York by Amy McKay, published in 2017. The book is set in New York, as you might have guessed from the title, in 1880 and is super, super fun. And I'm so excited to chat about the thing in our very first ever maybe to be published, maybe not, depending on how it goes, podcast with my fantastic friend, Noelle. 1880s is specifically special to me because uh, if, for those of you who don't know, Morgan and I both have YouTube channels and we are costumers and my favorite time in the whole world to costume is the 1880s. You know why? It's because that bustle butt. Mm-mm, us flat bottom girls got to get it however we can and I'll take a bustle. A little, uh, give you a little dunk a dunk. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you if you can't add it with surgery, a much cheaper way is to just add some some padding and, and fluff and ruffles, right? Yeah, absolutely. So how's your COVID been, by the way? For those of you who don't know, we're recording this during the lockdown. I uh, happened to be with Morgan when this all began. I know, it was just kind of nuts. Like, we're both West Coasters, but she happened to be visiting way up here in the Pacific Northwest with me, right when things were starting to go from that weird nebulous time when it was like we kind of started hearing more and more about this thing, and then it suddenly became like, oh, I think I think we might be told to stay at home. Yeah, and I got a, I got a lockdown order in the, it like, at your house, I think. <laughs> My county was going under lockdown and and my husband was like, uh, and I'm like, I'll be home in a day. Well, Hang on. You didn't want to just live with me for the next like five months? I was totally into that, but I don't know that Carl would have been excited about it. That is fair. That is fair. <laughs> Mr. Morgan would probably not have been down for that. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I am bored and looking for adventure, thus a new podcast. Yeah, this is a great idea. I'm glad you suggested it. Yeah, I'm I'm always down for new books. Like I'm a super avid book reader, particularly in audiobook format, and it's just a bummer not being able to hang out with your friends and be like, "Hey guys, I read this new book and I want to tell you about it." So, I'm going to do it virtually. Yeah, and uh, I am also a very avid reader, although also audiobook format. Obviously, we both sew since we both have costuming channels on YouTube. And I have lots and lots and lots of time where I can't use my hands to read a book, but I can definitely listen to one while I sit there and hand sew monotonously for days. <laughs> for sure. I used to be like in high school, middle school, whatever, you know, big, big, avid, normal book reader, I guess. You have the time, you have the hands, everything's great. But now that I'm after college and really into handicraft, it's just, it's so nice to be able to engage your mind mentally with a story and be able to physically do the thing, get the project done. It's really nice to have that kind of a, uh, what is it word, that word when two animals live together really well? Symbiotic. Yes. Symbiotic relationship <laughs> with a hand relationship and your what's going on in your head. It's great. So your hand and your head should definitely have a symbiotic <laughs> relationship, Morgan. <laughs> like, I'm not even going to touch that, but I'm just saying. <laughs> by the way, this is not sponsored by Audible, but if Audible would like to sponsor us, hit us up, yo. This week, we have decided this week and uh, presumably all future weeks, we've decided to pair our book with a drink so that we have something fun to kind of nibble on throughout the the podcast. And uh, as much as possible, we're trying to pair that. So this week in particular, I've decided to go ahead and pair our book, The Witches of New York, with a good, simple ginger beer, non-alcoholic. I chose this one because it's something with, with a little bit of surprising bite to it. Yeah, um, I did my pairing because we're going to both do them each time. And mine was surprisingly similar. I did a dark and stormy because while I 
also liked the bite and the sweetness that a ginger beer will give you, I also like a little kick. All right, well, let's dive right into it. Uh, we decided that we would like to redo the opening line of each book, which is rather difficult for us because, those, like we said, we get them both in audio format, so then we have to go listen to it 15 times while we type this out for you. But here you go. In the dusky haze of evening, a ruddy-cheeked newsboy strolled along Fifth Avenue, proclaiming the future. The great Egyptian obelisk is about to land on our shores. I, I do really like that line. And I think that it's this book is part of the reason I decided like, oh, we need we need to include the opening line because there's something so significantly place setting, both place and time and like the feeling that they're trying to evoke with the story that is set by the opening line right like we immediately Absolutely. get uh newsboy which i feel is very when you think newsy newsboy you think new york you think this kind of like early 1900s late 1800s kind of time period and then mentioning the great egyptian obelisk you like immediately are opening up with this sort of uh this interest in the exotic that i feel was also super popular throughout the victorian period and they they mentioned fifth avenue which is uh almost a character in and of itself in the book uh there's a hotel called the fifth avenue hotel that's in the book the whole thing is sort of surrounding fifth avenue as as new york does surround fifth avenue so it, it definitely brings you to the time and place very quickly i thought it was a it was a cool intro to this story and it sets you up really well for it. In fact, I feel like the entire first chapter just really sets a really nice mood for this story. So just a quick intro for all of you who have hopefully maybe already read the book if you are joining in on our fantastic book club adventure but for those who just need a quick refresh we have a few main characters we have our three main witches who have not yet met at the beginning of the the story here but we'll pretty quickly get together we have adelaide who is a witch who's got a um uh has been how do I put this? Maimed. Maimed is the word. Very viciously maimed. Graphically. And has lost lost sight in one eye and is very, I, I would say, kind of not well received in public because of it. And it, it definitely affects how her character interfaces with the world throughout the rest of the book. Yeah, she's bitter. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Soup. Soup's bitter. <laughs> we have her kind of assistant, Eleanor, and both of these characters have been raised as... Oh, you thought she was her assistant? Wow, I didn't get that at all. Really? Because so Adelaide was there first, and then Adelaide... Or, <laughs> Adelaide was there first, and then Eleanor was uh, hired on to be her helper. This was right after her her initial eye attack, when she was in yeah. that, like, super... You know, you're... When you get a yeah. grave injury, you kind of have that like that time period where you uh, theoretically maybe need a little bit of extra care and attention and aid. Absolutely. Isn't the house Eleanor's though? No, it's it's owned by uh, Mr. Palsham. Remember? Oh, He's yeah, you're him. right. Yeah. Oh, no, no. That's the tea shop, but the house that oh, they live oh, in. Oh, sorry. That's fair. That's fair. I'm thinking of the tea shop. So, but she yeah. she is her like tea shop assistant. Oh, I thought I felt so Adelaide or sorry, Eleanor's uh, powers, her witchy powers are that she's really good with tea and she can just do spells through her tea essentially and like hypnotize people. So I thought the tea shop was basically hers and her and Eleanor were partners at this point in the book at this point. Like I got oh, yeah. that they were very much an even ground. No, I, I would for sure say by the time that our third witch meets up with them, which is Beatrice Dunn, who's kind of a new not at all raised as a witch as the other characters are by the time she meets with up with them they are for sure like equals equals in this business yeah. equals in this partners in crime yeah. partners in non-crime because they're non-criminal witches witches are good it's true there, there's definitely not a lot of criminal activity going on here there is a, a fourth in this scenario though there's purdue they have a raven and this raven is I mean, I wrote down the word sentient, but I, I feel like he's more than sentient. I feel like he's an active participant in all things that happen with them. Oh, for sure. And he's awesome. There's a whole bit that we might get into later that hints that maybe he's older than all of the characters combined. But uh, yep. for right now, we're just going to assume he's a good, good raven. <laughs> he's a very good raven who happens to be able to talk and tell you when bad guys are coming so the the tea shop which is tea and sympathy if i remember correctly is located in this 15 
15 oh my god i really want this to be renaissance my favorite time period no 1880s it's not costuming morgan <laughs> 1880s <laughs> my time not yours shop in new york city <laughs> tea and sympathy which is as we've kind of mentioned a kind of close to the fifth avenue hotel or at the very least it's close enough that they can easily get back and forth between the two locations pretty pretty constantly throughout the book so let's see we have who what when where yeah kind of the the main kind of characters and things the book the only i think main 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 character that we have not discussed yet is our our good good not good bad guy boo <laughs> reverend townsend he's a religious zealot he hangs out with like I mean, for those of you who've seen Fantastic Beasts, he is the religious zealot in in those books or those movies as it as well. He's he's like those people are, and he's he's kind of crazy. He's like he's a reverend who's sort of lost it and gone over the deep end, and he's definitely a witch hunter. He's on the lookout constantly, trying to to nab some young women and take them back to his place and banish the evil from them. He super reminds me of that bad guy character in uh hunchback of notre dame oh yeah for sure absolutely 95 percent same vibes yeah absolutely <laughs> i can't believe i didn't think of that before now but if you can just picture that guy throughout this whole story perfect that's spot on yeah for sure agree so i have a question for you if you if you were to like visit this time period in this place maybe whether you meet the characters or not where where would you visit where would you want to be what uh, which scene in this lovely story would you want to check out? Oh, I would love to go to the tea shop. I mean, I love tea anyway, and I love tea shops anyway, and I would love to hang out with them in their um, familiar and comfortable environment and uh, feed the raven and just chill with them and learn from them. I think that would be like probably my most ideal situation. I'm kind of an out and about girl normally, but that that particular one seems like... The best possible yeah get my my palms read and my teas given to me talk to some of my ghost ancestors it'd be fun you super 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 hard same i feel like it's the sweet little tea shop that they describe they very much make it clear that not only can patrons come and buy their their teas you know the, the ladies who, who visit but there's definitely a hint of being able to get your your palm read your tea leaves read your just overall kind of slight future hinting and they they make it clear that the at least some of the witches that run the shop there's an interesting mix between actually magic telling your future type you know elements or may, maybe not maybe actual magic but um wisdom that's been passed down to them through their their mothers and mothers before them about what does this sign mean what is this little movement you know two teaspoons on the saucer versus you know, so on and so forth uh but there's also a big element of what's that phrase cold reading oh yeah for sure like there's parts of it where you're like oh you could be like one of those guys on tv for sure i absolutely got that vibe it seems like there was a, a bunch of times when they were mixing it. Specifically, Adelaide does that because one of her her power basically is that she can see a person's past, present, and future. She does it a little Sherlock Holmesy at some times, where like you know she's like, "Well, the mud on your shoes says that you've been here, and the small tear in your in your shirt means that you're, you know, a proper person, but not necessarily a lady, and all that kind of stuff." So I felt like she uses that specifically to her advantage the most. I think Beatrice is probably really oblivious to that. And Eleanor seems like a very practical person. So um, I think she would be able to cold read pretty well, too. Yeah, no, I, I think cold read is probably the wrong term because cold read is saying like, I think you hear the voice of a long departed J John. You know a John, right? It's a Someone common with name. the letter J. You know a John? Like, <laughs> that, that is yeah. not the right word. Sorry, my my bad. No, absolutely the, the Sherlock Holmesian, like, noticing of little details that are perfectly mundane, not magical in any way, but still giving information. That is what I meant. That is absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, I think cold readers use that too. Like, I think that's how they, they do their thing a lot of times is, you know, besides leading questions with like, did you know anyone ever with the, the first letter S in their name? <laughs> you know, you're just like, yes, everyone has. But they, they do the same sort of thing that I, I find that I find that endlessly fascinating because I, I notice a lot of things about people, but it's never that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> Who is your favorite character in this book? Oh, 
I mean, I love our three witches because they definitely have some really interesting elements for each of them. Like they're both, all, both, all three very cool in their way. But there's something really, really neat about um, Lena, the, the like housemaid that unfortunately ends up absolutely getting murdered because this is a story where several young women get murdered. But... Uh. Point of clarification, she does not get oh, murdered. Sh- she kills herself. You are right. She absolutely yep. does not get murdered. I mean, when you torture someone... Trigger warning for hanging also. Yeah, like, but if you torture someone <laughs> to the point where they want to murder themselves, yeah, that's pretty darn close. No, I agree with that. I, to- I totally agree to that. She didn't have a choice. Yeah, no, but your, your point of order does stand. But she's she's cool in that like she has a lot of interesting backstory she came from i think scotland they say her family from from scotland they mention how like she was married and her husband was working on the brooklyn bridge but he passed away but like she felt guilty about it because she saw his death in her dreams she felt like that was gonna happen so she absolutely didn't do a thing yeah to like make her husband die or to bother the person who eventually hired her as a housemaid clearly does have those those powers coming in that they mention in the book she seems like she'd be a cool person that yeah it's a shame she died so early i guess and she claims it by the end like she makes it her own yeah i agree She's awesome. I loved Purdue. Like, I thought he was just the coolest plot device ever. Like, give these witches a raven that can act as an alarm clock slash give them random information slash, like, he sort of just handles, like, anything that needs a little wrap up. (laughs) He'll deal with that. Yeah, like, they need to know where to go next. Make the birds say it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I, I probably should dive a little bit farther into the book than... Than just that, um, just so, so everyone gets a little refresher. Uh, at some point, Beatrice leaves her home in upstate New York and comes to the tea shop to, to take a job as an assistant. She meets that obelisk that we hear about in the first sentence. And a man on the railroad tracks, she actually has to hobo her way into, is that a proper word to use, a hobo? <laughs> um, <laughs> she hobos her way on the, on a on a freight train to get to New York because she is hell bound determined to get herself to this job she really wants to get out of dodge wherever she is she i think she's just bored she she thinks she's worth more and i i agree with her anyway she finds the obelisk on its path and a man comes and and lets her touch it basically and that seems to spark a lot of her powers to come in and she obviously does go to the tea shop meets up with those witches and does get that job and they start helping her develop those powers so the the book is is largely about them trying to help develop her powers there's another character though quinn brody he is adelaide's love interest um and he's a he's a doctor who's looking for proof of the afterlife what do you think about quinn i mean he i like that they've given a love interest that seems true he seems legitimate he seems like he's actually interested in the things that he says he's interested in i feel like and he's interested in the least attractive of the women yes to be fair as far as like what the book describes to us yes absolutely yeah and i I feel like it's so often that you get a story where like the initial character that they show as some kind of like a love interest character turns out to be false in some way or like sneaky or it's so nice, I guess, in like a weird little heartwarming way that no, he just he just likes her. He's so wholesome. <laughs> yeah, he's so wholesome through this book. He's a really good guy. I mean, this book is is very I guess we could talk about that too. It's very feminist. Like it's it's got a heck of a feminist bent to it. All the women are fairly powerful and all the men are either evil <laughs> or they're like Quinn Brody, who is actually kind of a feminist in his own right. Like he absolutely believes these witches when they say they are who they are and he treats them with respect and dignity and and unlike sort of men did during that time or maybe you know i'm sure some men were feminists at that time especially he's a good representation of one he he lets them have their own power as it were yeah although i feel like if i think about it a little bit further i don't know that there are any other good characters now that you mentioned it i don't know that there's any other character that is a good guy that's a man that is a man (laughs) sorry that is correct Like, for example, I mean, of course, we have the very not good reverend. We have Quinn's friend, who is also like a a kind of war wounded character. But he's like 
trying to go after women at the like insane asylum which is- oh yeah there's this insane insane asylum bit that uh i'll go on a diatribe about later i'm sure but they basically let men show up at this insane, insane asylum on the weekends and party with the the ladies they're in yeah what other male characters are there there's the ooh, there's the um new husband that beats his wife yep yeah or at the very least they strongly hint at they don't actually show scenes of them together at all but they very strongly hint that that's what's going on like and i i can't think of any other good male well characters. i mean produce a boy i don't know do they there's also this set of fairies like these fairies that bring you dreams did you get that either one of them was sexed in any way like did you get that either one of them was a girl or a boy not in a way that matters like yeah uh, like i don't i don't feel like it it matters at all what gender they were they were a pair of fairies that bring you dreams there's there's the landlord he's he's not he's He's not not a good guy but he's not great either yeah yeah okay yeah you got a point there <laughs> so now that i've i've solidly made my point no good guys but one want to tell us more about that uh that lovely insane asylum it's just d- dumb they have this insane asylum well okay i guess i want to talk about this about when we talk about things that we don't like about the story because i i have a diatribe that involves this that that happens so let's talk about all the stuff we do like about the story first so let's just give us give ourselves an overall hey did you like this i mean yeah, I feel like throughout the story, I was never tempted to like, oh, this is boring. I want to stop. No, it was absolutely yeah. entertaining and fun and uh, enjoyable throughout. I was definitely kind of constantly interested in ooh, what is this character? What are they doing? What's happening next? Like, oh, I don't trust that person. And I feel like those are all excellent elements of a story you know you want to know what's happening next so i feel like it's doing its good good job as a book to kind of keep me entertained and keep me interested i do feel like there are definitely some some bits that i want to learn about more it introduced lots of really really cool uh, characters and elements like the way magic works in the story was cool they they definitely give a lot of interesting things that I want to know more about for sure. Absolutely. I liked this book a lot. Also, I found the descriptions that they gave really, really good. They were very simple. And I am not a person who likes meandering long descriptions that just take forever. So yeah, Steinbeck, Stephen King, those are not my jam. I'm like, oh my god, I don't even care. They gave really succinct descriptions of people and places that used five or six descriptive words that just would absolutely enchant you and and put you into the, that place you would know exactly what that area looked like you would know exactly who that person was by the description i thought that was just they were very simple but vis- visceral i also really felt that the book was super like the feeling of it like we discussed earlier was really period correct they talked about the brooklyn bridge being built the statue of liberty making its way down the kids on Hall- all hollows eve were carrying turnip lanterns which would make a very special friend of ours, and a witch we all know and love, very pleased because she's into turnips. <laughs> the belief in magic, that that sense that was in the air at that time, but also a fear of the unknown that caused like people to be religious zealots. I thought all of those kind of like factors helped bring that book to life. I felt like the book took its time getting where it was gonna go. But it was never dull. It was all it was I would just call it like leisurely making its way towards the like final buildup of the story, but never like bored in any way. I, I did actually really like the book. For sure. I feel like there were lots of really kind of fun elements that were introduced, lots of really kind of interesting themes that the author is clearly trying to convey to you as the reader. It She's trying to introduce elements of feminism, of LGBT issues are definitely definitely brought up oh, yeah. uh, mental health as a concept and something to be considered both for for women and for for men the the concept of othering othering other groups that are not your group and like how we as people tend to deal with that a little bit of a, a what's it called egypt egyptomania yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is such a such a thing for the victorian age hysteria again as which is kind of back to feminism if we really want to get to it and that's that's kind of the overall arching theme of the book 
is feminism. Even the even the doctor on that island like talks about how it's actually really easy to get someone committed. Like as soon as a male just says that a woman should be there, they basically just drop them off, and that's the end of that. The, the woman is now trapped in the insane asylum, and the doctor's for some reason though he's in charge and he still doesn't let them out. So going back to your all men are bad. <laughs> Um, I would say that not to put anyone off by that because it's not in your face that way, but it definitely like when you stop and think about it, that definitely happens. For sure. I love that all of these different issues were talked about and discussed and, and, and brought up throughout the book. But I also feel like they were, I don't mean this unkindly, but maybe a little bit bluntly handled a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah. Not a lot of finesse to how they were discussed. I agree. Very fun and interesting and like, I love that they were brought up, but there there could have been more nuance. That's true. Um, was there a favorite like scene you had in this book? Anything that touched you particularly? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. So I would say two scenes that absolutely were the most effective on me, I guess. When you, when you think of what is most effective on a reader, you want something that, that touches them emotionally and makes them feel things. So I feel like the two scenes were the initial torture scene between the reverend oh and yeah that was Lena. bad uh-huh that was the scene that made me go oh oh this this book is way rougher than i was dark. expecting it to be that's the dark and the dark and stormy uh that's the bite in my gender <laughs> and uh, like it, it's not bad but it was definitely rougher than i was expecting and that that as a as a reader definitely kind of made me go oh oh Oh, <laughs> that's what story this is. Okay. And then I think the second scene that I actually really enjoyed was one of the scenes where Beatrice is kind of first learning about her, her new powers to talk to ghosts in particular. So she has one scene early on where she talks to like a the mother of another character, but she doesn't quite mm -hmm. realize what's going on yeah. like it's, it's not fully there she's talking to a ghost but she doesn't quite understand what's going on and then she faints at the end and so it's it's a kind of all not fully there fully realized kind of experience for her but the second one where she is talking to a client she's serving her tea and suddenly there's a little boy character and the little boy is like running around the little who's a ghost yes he's playing around under the table and she doesn't realize at first that he's a ghost until until she does and that kind of just like that that changes the the scene for her as a character and she absolutely once she realizes what's going on and kind of brings it up to the mother to realize all of this at once to have a mother whose child passed away very young and is still very much grieving over that child and then to have someone who is able to say things and bring up details that are very personal to that child because the kid was saying things like a snack that he had on him these peanuts that he was very into and she brought that up to the mom and the mom was like oh my oh my god that was literally his favorite thing ever and it felt very real to all the characters involved it was visceral to me i yeah literally cried <laughs> which i feel like as a a person reading a book is a you know it's a it's a real experience that you can have with a book that you don't get with a lot of you know a lot of media absolutely i feel like the one scene that hit it hard for me was actually let's just say lockdown related at one point beatrice is about to go do a presentation with Dr. Quinn, who is trying to expose ghosts to the world, in as it were. And she got told to basically stay in this room. You shouldn't be seen before this happens, blah, blah, blah. And she decides to leave anyway. And I'm just having this like very like COVID related response to it, just screaming like, what are you doing? Stay in the room. Stop. Stay at <laughs> home. <laughs> She's not even at home. And I'm screaming, stay at home. What are you doing? It's also the it's it's one of those scenes like when you're watching a horror movie, when you're they're all like, let's split up. I'll go to the attic and I'll go to the basement. And you're just like, what are you even doing? Stop. No, no. And you know, this is like a trope and it's going to happen. But yeah, uh, you're screaming at them anyway. Uh <laughs> Uh, that is something I super hate about any book or movie or show or whatever that I, I'm watching and engaging with, where a character does a thing that you're like, no, no, you're clearly not supposed to be doing this. This is exactly how you get murdered. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I was also like riveted at the moment when 
this is a plot twist, by the way. Purdue just out of the blue says, I'm not a raven. And you're just like, I'm, I'm sorry, what? What? You're not, what? What are you doing? Uh, <laughs> I guess, though, that I'm going to dive into the stuff that I don't like because this is this pa- panders right into that thing, too, um, which is there are a lot of plot points in this book that they set up. Like, it, it was clear to me that this is going to be a series or that the author wants it to be a series, although there's only a, a 0.5 version after this, uh, so a 1.5 book. So this book, to be fair, was uh, 14 hours long, and that one is only an hour and a half long. But there is a lot of dropped storylines. It felt like this she's trying to to set it up for the next sets of books but she introduced either these things too early or whatever i don't i don't even know but she set up the person who attacked adelaide so you fi- you find out at one point who it is and it's this friend of the doctor's and he's he's met this woman in the insane asylum and it turns out you find out that that woman is the person who attacked adelaide but then they just sort of drop that storyline there's also this dog that shows up at, for almost no reason and you're like why the dog Purdue saying he's not a raven. The dream fairies were definitely a thing that were like developed in the story quite a bit and then absolutely not like talked about very much after that. The insane asylum in general, like they 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 spent a couple chapters talking about stuff that goes on there and then they just the doctor goes there at some point and then goes, oh, you're the person who attacked Adelaide and then just quietly leaves and then you just don't ever hear anything about that again. And I'm like, but but. But what happened? What's all that about? Like, it seems like a lot of development for no payoff in this first book. It, and it makes me like, it doesn't make me not want to read the next. In fact, it does make me want to read the next books. But like, there's a little part of me that's spiteful. That's like, no, I should have gotten some of this in there. And that makes me angry. And yeah, bah. I guess another thing that I would say to the point that it's it's dull, but not leisurely is that this book took nine out of 14 hours to get going. <laughs> like there was nine hours of listening of things going pretty well, which is great. I mean, that's an in and of itself kind of a plot twist. Like, oh my God, everything's going fine for quite a while. <laughs> like this is all working out. Fantastic. But it's also like, there's no points of contention really other than occasionally you get a glimpse of a girl being tortured to death. Um, yeah. That's mostly <laughs> um, what you get is you kind of get that, like that slight setup of like something is not right with this preacher character. They keep, they do keep on like showing him like every couple yeah. chapters they're like being shady in the bushes being hella yeah. shady kidnapping girls yeah they do try to show that like mm, something is not right in new york but <laughs> that's that's much to get yeah everything's like just kind of working out for the main characters for quite a bit like oh i happen to have these new supernatural powers says beatrice oh look i have found two witches who will help me develop these in a very safe environment okay cool like that yeah. seems really convenient oh and by the way I just happen to have a friend who could really benefit from uh, having a a person who has newly discovered ghost talking powers. Oh, and by the way, I have a friend with this hotel who also could very much yeah. benefit from this new friend. Like, it feels very convenient. It's simplistic. The story is really simplistic. There's like an A storyline and not even a B storyline. There's an A and a like a 8.5 that's going on at any given time but it's it's not even as as complicated as like say the simpsons <laughs> which decidedly has a b storyline every time but yeah those are really my only complaints what it what did you not like oh goodness so i feel like as you mentioned there's lots of little there's talking about magic which i i do love i do love the story of talking about the rules of magic and how it works in the world there's lots of talk of magic and tea making and the the shop the little tea shop it's very cute and sweet but then like you said just not a whole lot of story moving until we're well over halfway through the book which i I guess I kind of get, I do realize, I do understand that the story needs to start out with introduction. You're introducing your characters and what they love and value in the world and what their goals are and things like that. But it feels like it just takes a very long time. It's meandering. To to get to that. Yeah. But that said, I did not have a point where I was listening and went, okay, come on, get on with it. I'm bored. I was just more like, hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Listening. 
And I, I think it's it's not even necessarily that it took super long to get started, per se, because I've definitely read a number of really long books <laughs> that, you know, once you look at the whole of the thing, the amount of time that this book spends getting started into the plot, into the real kind of meat of the story. Les Miserables, I'm looking at you. <laughs> I feel like I've definitely read comparable books, but... They also then have another 50% of the book with the meat, with the like, oh my god, here's all these crazy things that happen because of what we set up. Whereas this book feels like maybe the last 25% at best is that, that good, good consequences. Absolutely. I totally agree. Yeah. What is that book by Stephen King? Is it the Watchtower series? There's like a book, that book called The Watchtower by Stephen King. Um, it's a, it's actually an, I think an eight part series of books that Stephen King was actually, weirdly, he got hit by the car that he, remember when he, Stephen King got hit by a car and like, I think it was in the nineties. No. Okay. Morgan doesn't remember that because she was a <laughs> child and I was a full grown adult by then. Um, so, <laughs> um, so yeah, Stephen King got hit by a car and he was in the middle of watching, writing that series and people freaked out at him because like he had taken a break from writing the series and they're like no we have to know how this ends you cannot like you you have to live in a bubble until you finish this and i'm just like oh it's like people trying to bubble wrap george rr R. martin right now because they're like dude just finish the thing yeah i'm like oh or you could just watch the show <laughs> Anyway, the the Watchtower book takes like, I think that book is maybe like 110 pages long and 80 pages of it are exposition. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, I don't even care. Like, but the last 30 pages are 100% worth it's, it. It's very interesting reading content, I guess, which is what we're doing, right? We are, we are listening, reading a book and being someone who is a person who also makes content because I feel like it's very easy to hear commentary and criticism about something that someone has made yep. and looking at it from the other side is like, well, this is the story I wanted to make. So yeah, and and what's really ironic about this is like Morgan makes very concise and uh, to the point videos that go quickly and are very engaging the entire time, and I put out rambly hour long vlogs. <laughs> I am the Stephen King of vloggers. Oh no, I have to rethink my entire life now. What I'm saying is like <laughs> even as much as we're like sitting here and complaining about like oh it c it could have gotten to the point sooner. At the end of the day like yeah. I also get it. I get that like if you as a writer want to tell the story you want to tell, that's your thing, right? Like yeah. I mean obviously we as readers then get the chance to decide what we think about that and decide if that uh, that way that you've put out a story is engaging and interesting which i guess in the end like it was cuz we we stuck through to the to the end absolutely like, and and i would i would continue reading i want to read that 1.5 for sure um i do have a, a little piece of trivia about this is one of these which is one of the, i think it's i think it's eleanor but i'm not sure is actually in another book by this author in a completely different way and she's a oh. child in that book i think it's eleanor what? Yeah, right. I I was looking through the the Goodreads on this and found that, and I was like, Como. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I might check that out because that that might be interesting to like see the jump of a character jump into their own series. But we came into it at such a weird spot. Yeah, it's very interesting. I feel like when authors put out uh, more information about a character, here's something from their past or even distant future. I've seen that too. It's definitely cool to learn a lot more about someone that you've already learned a little bit more about which is fun so 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 why don't we talk a little bit about what we thought of this book yeah what's your rating what's your rating on this one rating 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 um do we have to rate in stars no you can rate any way you want with no definition of your values Perfect. Okay. So for my good, good buddies here who are listening, who have also read the book, like good book club members should, <laughs> then I think I'm going to rate this three out of five witches knots. Oh, she actually gave you the, the definition too. That's great. Uh, I would give it a uh, 3.6974. Mm, I, I'm a precise person. I do like your position. You're a computer person. I feel like computer people are always more precise. I I am a computer person. Uh, do you think it's worth a reread? So 
I do, especially given that like I already actually reread a half of it because I I was <laughs> like I I'm sorry I, for those of you who can't see me I made a very startled jump back. <laughs> <laughs> so I read the story and I was like, oh, okay, okay. It did kind of end abruptly. Yeah. And I, I feel like as much as we talked about all the build up, build up, build up, build up, not a lot happening. Blah, 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 and then suddenly kind of at the end, like a bunch of stuff sort of happens a little bit. Yeah. So I kind of was like, mm, I want to, I want something to listen to as I go to sleep. And I didn't already have a good thing prepared. I just go ahead and put the, put the book back on since I already had it downloaded right and uh so i you know we have a next book right like you could have just read that one i could or I can... i'm six hours into that one oh, shit. i need to catch up <laughs> okay good to know good to know so i i did actually go ahead and kind of re-listen to some of this and it actually was really really cool to like hear some of the introductions of various characters and be like oh <gasps> that person's going to do this thing. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, oh, like yeah. I, it's interesting because I don't know if, if you had asked me previously whether or not I was going to reread this, I probably would have said like, I'll wait a while. Like it's not, it's not super intriguing or like there's no major, major end of story plot twist that like changes the absolute face of the entire book. Like, but at the same time, once you've gotten to know characters, going back and re-listening to how they're introduced made me kind of go, oh, they actually introduced this this concept or this uh, this little bit of backstory really early on. I didn't even realize. Yeah. It was actually really, really cool. So I don't know that We're I'll... We're re-listening to or re-watching Farscape right now, and I'm having that happen to me too. <laughs> like, I definitely feel like it has a lot of value to to reread there's definitely some things that you'll catch that you've just kind of glazed over the first time over but i also feel like you could wait you could wait a couple of years and reread it and that'd be fine yeah i'd probably wait a little while to reread it um i i would definitely read the next book um if if there were other books in this seri series would you want to read them if there was already like i think a solid series like a solid five more books i'd yeah, be like all right yeah because <laughs> the author clearly set up so many things with the fairies and like the obelisk. I'm curious if there's more about that. I feel like there's lots of storylines that were set up, but then not really finished that feel to me like it's specifically meant to be, you know, more story for a future for future books. I didn't even consider that obelisk. Now I need to add that to my list of things that got dropped. Is that thing real, by the way? Do you know anything about that? Is there Was there really an obelisk that showed up in New York? Not that I'm aware of. Not that specific Cleopatra's Needle, okay. the obelisk. Right. Like, I don't think so. Uh, but then again, I, I, haven't, I haven't Googled it. So maybe there is, and I'm just hmm. not aware. But like, it moved out of New York. So they did kind of like finish that like, it was in New York on display for a while. And then the very end of the book, it was like moving out of New York. Yeah. So like, like they, they kind of did a thing with that. But anyways, point being, if there was like several more books to go, I think I would actually be down to go ahead and like just kind of, uh, what, what's that? Marathon. Marathon through them so that I can get all the rest of the story. If there's only like one or two books more, I'll wait for more. Yeah, there's only like a half of one. And at the rate that she's going, I mean, it's been three years since the last one was published and I didn't see a future one slated yet so and there's no wiki for this either so yep maybe it's the kind of same yeah. this is for sure a new series I feel like there, I know friends of mine who do not start a book series unless they That's know it's normally done. me like I hate hate reading books that aren't done like it's making <laughs> there's a specific book, book series that I particularly love uh, people might know it, the Harry Dresden series, and it is ongoing. It's on, this is, it already has 15 books and there is, uh, book 16 is coming out this summer and book 17 is coming out in the fall. The author took like three or four years to get through from 15 to 16, but he surprised everybody by dropping two books like sequentially, which is kind of awesome. But I know that there's only going to be 20 books, but man, I've been reading this series as they come out since book like six. Oh, it's making me crazy. I don't like waiting. I'm the person who is like making my husband just sit there and not watch Game of Thrones so that I could just <laughs> binge them all at the season. And I really just wanted the whole series. Like, I hate that stuff. Yeah. Uh, would you recommend this to a friend? Oh, um, I I would recommend it to a friend who I know is into Wicca and witchcraft and kind of occult-ish 
things. I feel like you, you, you have friends, right? If you think of your friends right now, you have friends who are into that sort of content. You're my only friend, Morgan. Oh, oh. okay. Well, I guess you could recommend it to me, who's already read it, and it'll be great. Uh, <laughs> and then we could talk about it, and we could make a podcast. It'd be great. But so I feel like if you if you have a friend who you know is into that kind of content, and I, I'm gonna admit, like either they're a female or someone who is definitely into like somewhat feminist yeah. content. Like, yeah, this is a distinctly like feminist flavored book. Yes, I feel like this is for, this is going to be horrible to say, people in the blue team, let's just say that. Um, <laughs> definitely. I would recommend it to a friend who was into urban fantasy, like, and who liked fluff books. Like, this book is really fluffy, guys, other than the <laughs> mild torture and suicide and- Yeah, you know, uh, fluffy minus torture. Yeah, if fluffy minus torture. To be fair, the torture scenes are not that bad, and they are- um not even as bad as anything you would see if you were say watching outlander no one gets raped um so i feel like it, you know it could be significantly worse but um if you like a fluff book that that doesn't complicate your brain too much this is a great book that i would recommend to people sometimes people just need candy you know like i read a lot of candy just because I, my life is is complicated and has lots of moving parts to it. And sometimes I just want to escape to a world that is easy to be in. 100%. So, I, this is honestly, I feel like that's my favorite uh, viewing genre is stuff that's fluffy and light and uh, maybe a little bit of comedy. I, just, I like light. I hate it when I look at a new story and I hate all the characters because they're all jerks. Yeah. It's, if you want to care, if you want content where you like all of the people with a few exceptions this works out really well for you yeah are you ready for speed round sure yeah hit me all right i for people who are new to this game which is everyone since this is our first episode <laughs> um i am gonna do a speed round every episode where i ask five questions of morgan and those questions are going to be varied although i may repeat them from time to time because these questions are actually kind of hard to come up with as i figured out by writing these five questions. You ready? <laughs> I'm ready. All right. If this book were a color, what color would it be? Green, because magic is green. Okay. If you had to rename this book, what would you rename it? Oh, good God. Um, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm a jerk. Sorry. Uh, uh, oh, no. Speed, 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 speed. Okay. Um, the raven that talks. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair right before this happened uh morgan asked me to write a jingle like on the spot and i just was like no <laughs> so this is payback um if this book were a lightning struck tree what kind of tree would it be uh oak because i feel there's something very magical about oaks you know what i mean i feel like there's something magical about all trees but oaks in particular real magical uh if this book were a potato chip flavor what flavor would it be I'm going to go barbecue. A little bit of that uh, sour tang to go with sweetness. All right. If you had to describe this book in three words to someone else, how would you describe it? Three words. Uh, word one, witches. Like the easy one. Okay. Next, 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 next. Ghosts. Lots of ghosts. I don't, I don't know if we mentioned it. Lots of ghosts. Witches? Lots of ghosts is three words. Witches. Ghosts. Uh um potato chips no um <laughs> uh uh oh 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 um uh preacher preacher okay yeah, yeah that's an evil preacher character all right what are we reading next morgan we are going to be reading together and hopefully with you joining us ready player one so i hope you will enjoy will enjoy i hope you will join us <laughs> for our next book club book all right so we got a little homework for everybody we're going to give you three assignments the first assignment is to rate this book on your purchase platform if you have read it because ratings give authors uh, a great boost rate this podcast on whatever platform you decided to listen to it and follow us on instagram at ladies who genre all one word